if you are experiencing a fear-based work environment, what are you going to bring home to your kids? So my name is Allison Sibula, and this is something that's really um, an important topic to me because I've worked in so many coercion-based work cultures. And it was, it, it's kind of sad. It's kind of funny, but yesterday I posted a meme onto my Instagram account that said, have you ever worked in a workplace so bad that everyone that shows up to work is like secretly applying elsewhere? And a friend of mine responded, I don't think I've ever worked in a place that wasn't like that. And that makes me so sad. And I was like, wow, um, that's really profound. And I think um, I, I have many, many, many negative experiences. Luckily, I have a lot of really positive experiences as well. So that is what I'm going to be drawing on today. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is this gratitude exercise. And so go ahead and if you have like a pen and paper or your iPhone, or um, just go ahead and write down three things that you are grateful for. And we'll take a minute and this will be our check-in. If you want to share anything that you came up with in the chat, feel free, but um, no need. Um, it is pretty incredible how well gratitude works for... Um, helping us self-soothe and helping us feel better and helping us move activity in the brain so that we're um, um, feeling calmer and better and more focused. And yeah, I still always forget to do it. Um, so today I'm really grateful for um, the sunny weather here in California and um, that I have lots of great support, much of it coming from many of you and for my good health. Um, take a deep breath and really feel into the sense of gratitude and notice what it feels like in your body. Today, we're going to cover defining workplace abuse and neglect and psychological safety. We're going to talk about agreements and consent, and we're going to talk about tools to improve. Um, we're also going to kind of talk about, uh, dark tribe personalities at work, <laughs> So, um, awesome, Danielle. Okay, great. Yeah, gratitude. Yeah, getting a good journal is is going to be so key. I love these paper moleskin journals um, that I order, I guess, on Amazon, although I should buy local. But um, this is like, I, I put everything handwritten in here. So yeah, getting a good journal, yeah. Um, okay. So this is um, something that I had in um, my last presentation that I like to come back to. This is an amazing resource. I highly recommend listening to this audiobook by um, Gabor Mate, trauma expert. And he says the research literature has identified three factors that universally lead to stress, uncertainty, the lack of information and the loss of control. And so on today's topic, doesn't that seem kind of interesting? lack of information and loss of control, um, kind of want to be thinking about maybe that's the definition of coercion. So let's define terms. What is abuse? Any action that intentionally harms or injures another person. However, in once you become trauma-informed, you come to know that not everything that happens is intentional, but it still doesn't mean that it's not abusive. So um, this is an interesting definition, like a very basic definition, but of course there are actions that are, the intent is not abuse, but the impact is abuse. And that is still abuse. Um, but what about workplace abuse? What, are, what does that look like? And I have a whole bunch of ideas, but go ahead and put some in the chat. So to me, one of the biggest ones is threats. Oftentimes, workplace abuse that feels really stressful, there is an underlying or overt threat that if you don't do X, Y, or Z, your job is at risk. And when your job is at risk, you won't be able to pay your mortgage or your rent. You won't be able to buy groceries. You won't be able to buy your child what they need for school. 
And so um, this threat um, is actually a very, very real threat that creates a, a sense of fear in the workplace. Um, offensive language, microaggressions, pranks and jokes, um, offensive um, physical behavior or um, sexual advances, exclusion, insults, gossip, rumors. Um, not all gossip is bad gossip. Um, research shows that gossip is a great um, tool by uh, employees being abused to be able to communicate with each other about the abuse of power. But this is the type of gossip where higher ups are um, kind of what we say is like punching down at lower employees um, or spreading gossip in order to exclude someone and, and um, make sure that they leave. Um, undermining employees' competence and insults and bullying. Um, and then from the chat, we have lack of transparency, especially in financial issues being yelled at. Yeah, I um, I have an example of, of my very first job ever um, at a bagel shop. The owner like came and just screamed her head off at me. And this was my first job. And so one of the first things that I learned about work was that um, I couldn't really trust the people in authority to not lose control and um, kind of go psycho on me because it's never, it's actually just never okay to yell at anyone ever, um, but especially not at work. Being ignored or dismissed. Yeah. Um, withholding performance reviews and feedback. Okay. Yep. Gaslighting. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and especially when it comes to lack of transparency, it's especially egregious at nonprofits because those nonprofits are supposed to belong to the public and they're supposed to be transparent. Actually, nonprofits really should be publishing their financials every year. A lot of them don't. Um, okay, so what is neglect? And it's weird because we don't often think about workplace neglect. We kind of don't think about maybe like I'm entitled to something at work. <laughs> So the state of being uncared for. So what are some of your ideas about what is workplace neglect? I think some of some of your um, answers fall under that category. So I'll, I'll give some of mine. Um, failing to notice when someone's in distress, failing to care if they're in distress, failing to understand how much oversight um, certain tasks need, um, failing to understand what type of training an employee needs and failure to offer it, um, which is often accompanied by this anger that they didn't already know how to do it, even though they needed to be trained on it, um, including lack of onboarding, um, which is so, so, so prevalent, so much more prevalent than you would think. Um, not paying wages on time or forgetting to submit important paperwork like health insurance. Um, Lack of onboarding, lack of technical support. I'm just reading from the chat here. Lack of supervision or giving objectives and goals. So good. Um, having your opinion shut down, ignored, or dissed. Yeah. Yep. 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 Thank you. You guys are. You guys know. <laughs> so um, now we're going to talk about coercive control. And just like my last talk um, a couple of weeks ago um, on preventing burnout through emotionally attuned management. Um, we are going to borrow from other fields of study and apply it to the workplace. It's kind of amazing how we will continually, you know, for example, tell someone you must leave an abusive relationship. Here's what's happening if you're in an abusive relationship. Oh, no, but you must stay at your abusive job. You absolutely must. It's embarrassing. You can't put that on your resume, you know, if you leave. It's You haven't been there long enough. So it is absolutely wild that we know really well about the science and social science um, of abuse and what interpersonal abuse is, and yet we have these very separate domains. So coercive control is any pattern of oppressive, dominating behavior that uses harm to steer your thoughts, feelings, and actions. And so when it comes to coercive control and intimate partner relationships, this is well studied. And, you know, if you go into like a health center, they will actually give you um, pamphlets. You know, here's how to spot the signs that you may be in a relationship that has coercive control so that you can leave. We don't do this at work. 
So, but we're going to start, okay? This is, we're all here and we're going to start, okay? So signs of coercive control, assault, threats, insults or humiliation, isolation, activity monitoring, financial control, sexual coercion, removing autonomy. Okay. What features of work in the United States make it inherently coercive? So again, here's the list. Which ones of these make workplaces in the United States inherently coercive? Yes, we have a long history of um, not just coercive control, but yeah, physical control, all sorts of different types of control. Yeah, Carrie, um, starting with enslavement. Yeah, absolutely. And indentured servitude. So here's my ideas. Healthcare tied to employment is, a, is coercive control. Having your source of income, which you need to pay your bills and buy food and your housing, tied to work with no employee protections. Um, at will employment, employees um, being let go at any time for no reason, again, with no social safety net. Um, oftentimes you see really insular teams with no oversight, you know, who raise your hand if you've been in one of those where you're like, hello, does anyone care that we're like basically being abused by a narcissist? Like, doesn't anyone care that this is happening? And they don't. And so this gets to be a situation where there's coercive control. There's no outside oversight coming in to make sure that you're okay. In fact, um, going to HR not only doesn't work, but sometimes makes it worse. And in these types of environments, you're often at the mercy of your manager and whatever personality disorder they might have. A note about dark triad personalities at work, okay? Um, dark triad is something that I really didn't have a need to know about until I really did. Um, raise your hand if you've ever worked with someone with, um, you know, one or all three of these. Yeah. Um, it gets to be pretty scary. So this is psychopathy, narcissism, and Machiavellianism. Um, and so Machiavellianism to me is really scary because they'll kind of often throw you under the bus to get whatever, whatever they may, might need. So, um, it's good to be on the lookout. And they're pretty prevalent. So did you know that the prevalence of psychopathy in the general adult population can roughly be estimated to be at 4.5%? So that's about one out of every 22 people. So that's a lot of people. If you kind of think about, and, they're, and they tend to be um, over or underrepresented in some places. But what's interesting, because I was looking at a meta-analysis, is that the prevalence of psychopathy is significantly higher among workers in some organizations, including managers and executives. <laughs> and um, that feels true, doesn't it? Doesn't that feel true? And that's because we have a culture of rewarding psychopathic tendencies and promoting them. So um, if it feels like, gosh, how can, how, how can work culture be like this? Um, we, um, we have built a society in which we you know, go after capital gain more than taking care of each other. Um, this is a resource that I'm just going to um, share with you, but it's the bite model of authoritarian control. You know, for me, um, and let me see if this is the next slide. Okay, no. Um, so I started watching um, cult documentaries and actually learning about cults is what helped it finally click in for me as to certain abusive things that were happening at work and how that was actually coercive and authoritarian control. So um, I do highly recommend checking out various um, cult podcasts. This is an author who writes a lot of great books and he has this great model to kind of understand um, how um, we can be coerced and controlled. So why does authoritarian control show up at work? And some of you have already put this, Carrie, you put this in the chat. Um, 
but we have, you know, we have whole systems, right? And so we have a lot of historical, I have this book um, that is actually, I highly, I can't recommend it enough. It's called The Chalice and the Blade, Raise of Hands, if any of you have read this one, um, by Ryan Eisler. And it is about the history of, yeah, the history of hierarchical um, and domination-based um, societies on earth <laughs> in the human population. Because we, I guess we weren't always like this. We um, we had non-hierarchical um, societies and then they started to become more violent and hierarchical. And so I highly recommend this. And it, that started to happen when um, Western religions were um, introduced um, uh, particularly the Old Testament had a really um, domineering God. They moved away from the goddess, goddess worship and towards a um, male dominating God. And so there's a lot of, you know, that's infiltrated sort of our, our whole culture, right? And so within the U.S., then, of course, we have, um, as was said in the chat, the very basis of the foundations was how can we... Um, go make a lot of money? How can we exploit labor? How can we enslave people? How can we um, murder the people who are already here so that we can make as much money as possible? And so we are still feeling the downstream effects of this history of authoritarian control and um, hierarchy today. And, you know, another thing is that um, we just don't really have that many legal protections for workers in the United States. And if I'm missing anything, please put it in the chat. But, you know, it's it doesn't always come down to maybe like, you know, it's like your one toxic boss's fault. You know, there's so many systemic factors. I wanted to get into, um, you know, how what's the impact of experiencing this abuse and fear and control at work? Chronic stress may show up as like really impossible deadlines or high pressure or a false sense of urgency or being forced back to the office, even though you were very productive at home, working long hours, uh, maybe no boundaries as to when your boss can contact you or having an abusive boss or sexual harassment or being bullied or unstructured work with a lot of chaos. Um, at Tend Collective, we think that the biggest factor based on attachment theory and social psychology is not having managers and colleagues who genuinely care about our well-being. We think this is going to cause a lot of stress at work. So what happens in the brain with chronic work stress? Um, we get increased prolonged cortisol. And so um, you know, in last week's webinar with Brie, she talked about, you know, there's different types of stress. And of course, there's healthy stress. You need to have, you know, a healthy amount of stress so that you can get stuff done and um and and function just normally. But when you have prolonged, really high amounts of cortisol with no breaks, um, which is toxic stress, this is going to cause some really long-term damage. So um loss of long-term memory, um, harm to the prefrontal cortex, which we need to pay attention and to um, do executive functioning. So this is basically, you know, can how's your working memory? How's your flexible thinking? And how is your self-control? I like to think of executive functioning as like, are you able to do the thing you want to do when you want to do it or not? Does something get in the way? Um, and there's also an increased risk of dementia. So lots of long-term things as well. So as we watch this video about toxic stress in children, it's three minutes long. I just start thinking of maybe like some critical questions and I have some, some critical things to ask. As we develop, our brain produces 250,000 neurons every minute. By birth, we'll have 100 billion of these miraculous building blocks. But in order for our brains to fully function, will need synaptic connections to organize and build networks. Who we become and how we function depends entirely on how these networks develop, and our interactions with others and how we've been treated determines everything. From functions like heart rate, breathing and basic emotions, to personality, decision-making, language, social behavior, and voluntary movement. We know that severe or prolonged abuse or neglect derails that building process even in the womb. 
distress and high anxiety in the mother allows cortisol, the stress hormone, to cross the placenta and disrupt development. When the toxic stress response is activated repeatedly, brain development and even immune systems are disrupted. Research has shown that high doses of stress hormones inhibit brain function and impulse control, overbuilding the fear center and the part of the brain that's critical to emotional regulation. TBRI uses three sets of principles to begin the healing caused by toxic stress. By recreating the developmental process, TBRI strives to introduce the nurturing that was absent in those toxic situations. And for the child who has endured toxic stress, healing must begin with a sense of both physical and emotional safety, something this child may have never known. Connecting principles are designed to create and nurture healthy relationships through sensitivity, consistency, and availability to disarm fear and gain trust. Giving full attention, using a gentle voice and kind facial expressions and body language are just a few of the ways to help build trust. Punitive and controlling responses only feed a child's mistrust and fear. Empowering principles are designed to meet physical needs, including sensory regulation, nutrition, and hydration, and strive to be aware of environmental issues, such as overstimulation by light, noise, or smells that can trigger behaviors that often leave caretakers baffled. The goal of the correcting principles is to help guide a child through day-to-day -day strategies, by correcting fear-based behaviors and establishing felt safety, helping a child regulate their emotions, tell their stories, and learn through playful engagement. The Adverse Childhood Experiences study examined the effects of multiple types of abuse in childhood, and the staggering results showed that high doses of childhood adversity affect brain development drastically, leading to addictions, attempts at self-medication, impacted immune systems, chronic inflammation, and autoimmune diseases. The greater the number of traumatic events, the greater the damage. TBRI can help stop this ugly cycle. There is hope for the damaging effects of toxic stress, but it will take dedication, education, and most of all, understanding. Okay, so this is actually a really well done video, like the illustrations are really important. And I think they say a lot of things about trauma informed care really well in a short amount of space. However, what felt missing to anyone? This is what jumped out at me something felt really missing. Feel free to write in the chat. So I'll say what my thought was. Why are the parents stressed <laughs> why are the parents stressed why are the parents treating their kids with punitive fear-based parenting why why are why are the kids getting aces <laughs> and it seems so missing that it's just absolutely insane i um was thinking about this recently with the californian um aces aware project where, where there were now screening children for adverse childhood experiences in medical clinics and i keep thinking about because i read a um a paper that just came out by christy bethel and um Ev uh what's his name mochtinger um, the researchers and it was saying that it's well known and well documented that um that health clinics are actively traumatizing, just like Bree said in her webinar last week, organizing around trauma, actively traumatizing their workforce. Why are we screening children when you are traumatizing someone's mother right in your office and then sending them home to be with their kid? It, it doesn't make sense. The order of it is wrong. Stop screening the kids treat your employees better. Those are the parents. And whether or not screening ends up being um, a good thing or not, maybe it will. It seems like the wrong order to me. And so we're constantly in the trauma-informed field being shown, you know, make sure that you um, tell parents, you know, they need to do this, this, and this, and this. But if the parents are being abused in economically in our society, there is no way we're going to break out of this pattern. If you're experiencing a fear-based work environment, what are you going to bring home to your kids? Right, Danielle, right, right, right. 
but we know we we have the statistics on how many sociopaths are at work okay look we you can't hide from that this is an audio clip um that i'm not going to share but essentially um it's about defining consent this was like the podcast that made everything click into my brain I had never thought about defining consent in other realms of existence until I heard this podcast. So I hope that you all will like write this down and listen to it. It's so good. A little bit culty. Um, Sarah and Nippy were in the um, show, The Vow, about escaping the cult Nexium, the, the one with like all the celebrities in New York. And so they have great guests on to talk about coercive control. And basically what these um, women are sharing is that once they started delving into trying to define consent, they found that there were no legal definitions of consent in any realm in the United States. So that's interesting. Moving towards solutions, okay, I am going to play a little bit of this audio lecture by Steve Chandler. He has kind of a funny sounding voice, but he is giving a way for us to move away from coercion and authoritarian control in the workplace and how we might think about structuring a workplace that has really strong agreements. Hi, this is Steve Chandler, and I wanted to talk to you today about expectation and expectation contrasted with agreement. Really, we have two choices in life when we relate to other human beings. One is to have expectations, and the other is to create agreements. Expectations are toxic, and they ruin people's chances at a good relationship. Let me give you an example of that. I went to work with a company recently, and they had all kinds of performance breakdowns and productivity breakdowns, and I was asked to go train them in the owner-victim choice so that perhaps morale could be lifted a little bit among the people on the line who were creating the products. Well, the real problem was in the leadership. The leaders had expectations of their people. So they would walk around expecting certain things. They would expect certain levels of job performance. They would expect quotas to be met. They would expect certain quality standards to be hit. And they had all these expectations. And then there were the people themselves who were trying to live up to the expectations of the leaders and really resenting the leaders because they said most of the expectations were unreasonable. They didn't really realize how understaffed they were and stressed they were. So the whole place was in a morale crisis, I would say, a total morale crisis. And as I moved among the leaders and talked to them and tried to figure out how can we fix this, they would tell me about a certain employee who wasn't living up to expectations. And I would say, well, okay, so what's the expectation? And they would say, well, we expect them to get this job done by Friday so the customer can have it. The customer expects it. We promised the customer the job on Monday, so we want it finished at the plant by Friday. And I said, okay, great, so what happened? Well, it wasn't done. And it wasn't done until next Thursday. So the customer was very upset. Pretty soon, we lost our preferred status with the customer, and everything went downhill. Well, I said very quietly, who was in charge of that product being done? And he said, well, the supervisor in the plant. I asked him a question that startled him, or at least quietly left him speechless. I said, what was your agreement with him? And he looked at me as if I had asked him, have you taken a ballet lesson lately? Or some very strange question. And he didn't answer. And then he said, well, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, on the matter of getting this done by Friday, what was your agreement? And he said, well, you mean I have to have an agreement with everybody? I got to go around and get an agreement? He knew I expected it by Friday. He got my email. He knew the customer was expecting it by Monday. I don't want to have to go hold his hand. He's a professional. I'm a professional. And I said, well, look, 
here's what doesn't work in the workplace. Expectations. People do not look forward to living up to expectations. In fact, people rebel against expectations. They don't like it that you expect things of them. They would rather you agree with them about something. And so we worked together. I brought the foreman in. We sat down. He said, do you agree to have the next job ready by Friday? And the foreman said, well, I would like to, but I'm a little understaffed, so I can't promise it for sure. And the leader looked a little startled and said, well, what can you promise for sure? If you gave me one extra person to work on it, I could promise it Friday for sure. If I don't have an extra person, I can promise it next Tuesday for sure. The leader thought for a while, and he said, I'll give you an extra person. Now, with an extra person, what can I count on? Well, you can count on Friday. Thank you. They shook hands. Now, that's an agreement. That's so much stronger than an expectation. I just love that audio clip. <laughs> um, if you have any reflections, please feel free to add to the chat. But it kind of, it like feels very intuitive. Like, yeah, you might want to ask, you know, your, your, your employee if they can, and then see what they say and what they need. Um, but we don't, we don't do this. It's not standard in our society to have this nice, well-attuned back and forth where we pay attention to people and we see what they need. And then they tell us, and it's a negotiation. Um, I would say that the places that I've worked, um, are, um, don't do that very often. I, I, you know, again, I think it's been about half and half for me in terms of positive work environments and really negative ones. Um, not asking is dehumanization in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. It's wild, but you know, now I, I encourage you all, um, and I'll send out the full clip to everybody when I email everyone, that's really good. Um, to start thinking about the various ways, you know, whether it's at work or socially, that there's expectations instead of agreements and dialogue. Because we we all do it a lot, actually, where we <laughs> sometimes can expect things without um, asking first if that's going to work. So healthy workplaces, psychologically safe, they ask instead of tell employees. Um, they invite employees into projects or invite employees to create projects with their own ideas. As an example, you know, um, uh, if I'm thinking of an employee that I managed um, at one of my past jobs, and even though as their manager, I know exactly what they're working on, that's my job, I still always say, hey, do you have time this week? I have a new project. I would love to invite you into it. I'm going to tell you about it. You let me know what you think after I tell you, if this is something you want to do and you can do, and we'll create the project together. Do you have time? I know they have time. Asking them if they have time gives them back that control and that autonomy and that sense of their humanity. Okay. It's just so, so, so important. Every time we invite people that we work with to work with us, every task or project it's an invitation and we should be negotiating these agreements with each other all the time, right? Employment is an agreement. You're saying, I'm going to give you 40 hours a week. You're going to give me this amount of money every week. And that's an agreement. And then there's the agreement on your job description. I'm agreeing to do this set of 10 tasks. And oftentimes those, that set of tasks is not exactly what the person ends up doing. And so you are going to end up renegotiating agreements over and over and over and over. They need to be renegotiated every project. If something changes that it needs to be, uh, and I like, you know, humanized, this person is a human being with autonomy and the need to feel like they have control in their life. And so you need to invite them rather than tell them. And this will create a psychological, psychologically safe environment in which we get access to all the parts of our brain that help us make good work. 
Um, when we feel safe, we can think more creatively. We can think more reasonably. We're less emotional, right? We're not in fear all the time. We can focus. We remember stuff. We need this. Oh yeah. Nonviolent communication. Yeah. I do a whole, a whole one on that in my job grief support group as well. Um, so managers care about how the, the people are doing and feeling, um, the agreements, this is like enthusiastic consent, you know, the agreements feel good to all parties and they're reasonable. Um, they're clearly communicated. I know I'll, I see a lot of nonprofits that I've consulted, um, miss that step, right? You need a strategic action plan and you, and people need to see the plans in writing. Um, managers notice when employees are stressed and help them adjust. Um, and hard conversations are not accusatory. Everyone is treated as an autonomous adult. Unconditional positive regard is given, which is where you assume that people are trying their hardest. And if they're not giving the output that is needed, they probably need something. They probably need a resource of some kind. Um, allowing employees to complete their work in a flexible manner. Someone that was in my job grief support group forwarded me an email that their manager sent them. And the I mean, I was just like, on what planet is this okay to ever treat someone like this? But they were like, hey, I, you know, when we met at 9 a.m. and I mentioned that you need to call Jane, uh, you know, it, she told me that you didn't call her until 4 p.m. And I really was expecting you to call her at 10 a.m. <laughs> like just stripping away all autonomy that this person is going to be able to get their work done in a way that makes sense to them. And that trust has to be there. Um, and that challenging the manager is actively encouraged. There's a process for it. Um, and transparency. If I'm missing anything, please include it in the chat. This is something that I included in my last one about uh, burnout and management. But essentially, oh, and I'm seeing some of the typing got a little messed up. What we're striving for is to be in this just right category of being a well-attuned manager, right? We don't want to be too overbearing on employees or too aloof. And so I do highly recommend going back and watching my other one on um, preventing burnout with emotionally attuned management. But essentially, aloof managers are more on the neglectful side of things when we're talking about neglect not quite meeting all your needs. Um, overbearing managers are the micromanagers, the ones that aren't trusting and that um, don't really like your boundaries and have unreasonable expectations. And the just right managers are well attuned. Um, and it's all the things that we've been saying. This is a culture that's built on trust. So um, what are the, what's the way forward here? Um, if you're a toxic workplace and you do nothing, you're going to experience high turnover, low productivity, low creativity, and a loss of revenue from having to constantly train employees and the fact that they're not really getting that much done. Um, and maybe they're also taking more sick days. Um, and as we said, with all the brain activity, you know, the creativity is lower, the memory is lower, the executive functioning is lower in a fear-based environment. You're going to lose. So you're a toxic workplace and you get an outside assessment. I do think it's really important to hire an outside group to do assessments. Um, so Tend Collective offers these. Um, some folks here on this call also offer these. And I think it's gonna be really important in a toxic workplace that do, does this, which is interviewing employees and surveying them and figuring out um, where are the bottlenecks in this organization? What's blocking forward momentum? You're going to discover who the toxic leaders are and the toxic employees, and you're going to take steps to let them go, which is going to see higher morale, higher productivity, better health, saving the company money. Let's say you don't have a toxic workplace, but it's just slightly dysfunctional, but you decide to hire a coach um, or a trainer. So what you're going to experience is that um, managers and employees learn and develop skills over time how to communicate better, how to resolve conflict, how to listen, how to care and engage, how to set and keep healthy boundaries. And this is going to keep stress low 
and it's going to be an environment of growth and learning. It's going to increase the executive functioning and working memory, increase enthusiasm and creative solutions, and create happy and healthy employees who stay. So the example of the happy, healthy workplace what happens in those, and we can kind of think of them, is that people from other departments or like other nonprofits or other organizations are like, hey, what's going on over there? It seems like you really like your job. I would really like to get a job there, but there's never any job opportunities because people don't leave. <laughs> and wouldn't you like to create a workplace like that? So um, we at 10 Collective can do assessments where we survey and interview employees, we can do training um, series. Um, we especially love to train people managers on the science of toxic stress and the brain and how it can relate to helping your company grow. Um, we also do diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings, um, which are also a huge, huge part of decreasing stress and improving creativity. And, um, and then we do coaching and I've done a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching with managers. And the thing is, if you're not a sociopath, if you're not toxic, you can change. And I have seen it so many times. Someone saying, I just got promoted. I'm managing this whole team. I'm not doing it very well. I don't know what I'm doing. And we just work one-on-one, -on -one, you know, for an hour a week. And we just start slowly building skills and changing some of our, right. We're, we, we've already established that we've been brainwashed for authoritarianism in our society. So we just start to look at some of those. Well, why is that coming up? Well, where did you learn that from? Well, how can we change that? What if we had unconditional positive regard? What could that look like? What if they're doing their best? What is this person? What are they maybe going through? And how can we offer some empathy? What resources do they need that over time you see? Um, a huge increase in the ability of that manager to manage. In fact, I um, worked with someone at a, um, a major significant company, corporation, who um, had been um, told that they really need to improve their performance as a manager. And after working together for a year, um, this person became manager of the year. So change happens. It's, it's all skills we can learn as long as we're not, you know, we don't have a dark triad personality. So um, companies, you know, if you hire 10 Collective, you're going to see less turnover, less sick days, more productivity, and happy employees that start referring their smart and productive uh, friends and acquaintances and former colleagues to apply. So pretty soon you're going to have all the best people. Um, and so we've, we've talked about this, helping your employees feel safe is going to help the brain in every, on every level. Um, and feeling safe at work is feeling like the people here care about me, they support me, I'm given the resources I need to thrive, I have enough time off to rest and recover. People need more than two weeks, okay? People really need more than four weeks. There's an element of play and creativity and fun. I can bring up difficult topics. There's no retribution when I challenge authority. Um, and I'm given that unconditional positive regard. So people trust me that I'm doing my best work. So... I hope you will consider working with us. We can help you with all of that. Habit change is really hard. You shouldn't try and do it on your own. It's way too hard. Um, and we offer a whole suite of services. We also offer like, um, you know, just regular public health and, and social work type services. We can help with program development and grant, um, grant writing and literature reviews and all that. But what we're really focused on is inside out transformation. Um, so how you treat your employees is going to create a huge ripple effect across um, all of society. You know, we have to start within our organizations. And we know that being able to rest within a small bubble of care in our workplaces gives us so much strength and resilience. We are at work 40 hours a week and nothing feels better than feeling respected and safe and empowered at work. So I hope you will reach out. Thank you for joining. Um, it's wonderful that you all were here. And um, if you have any additional comments or feedback, you can put that in the chat. Next week, oh, I didn't put a slide up. Next week, Danielle is going to give um, a presentation on um, what does sociocultural trauma have to do with the workplace? So an even deeper dive into some of the topics that we touched on. Let me put that link in the chat um, so that you can sign up for that one's going to be so good. These are all of our upcoming events. Yes. Come and tell a friend. 
Um, and tell your whole workplace, tell your whole workplace, I'll email everybody who signed up and tell them to do that. Um, and we also have a book club in a couple of weeks with the author on restoring the kinship worldview. Um, and then we have the next job grief support group starting at the end of March. So thank you all so much. And we will see you next week.